Dr. Schultz, today we're talking about surgery and radiation side effects. A lot of times we have patients coming who are newly diagnosed and they're trying to decide upon treatment, and the side effects of these issues will affect their quality of life for the rest of their life, and I don't think the medical community is bringing this up enough. So today we're going to ask you, first of all, um, I do want to point out you're a medical oncologist, so you're not somebody who's doing surgery like a urologist, and you're not a radiation oncologist who's doing radiation. You don't receive any funds or anything for deciding upon these two when you're talking to patients, and so that gives you a very non-biased point of view. Um, first of all, can we give a little background as to how surgery came to be and then radiation came to be, and maybe talk about some of the um, preconceived notions patients may have regarding that? Giving a historical concept is really useful because the uh, landscape, as we know with all technology over the last 15, 20 years, has been evolving very quickly. Lots of new things coming out, lots of improved uh, resources, not only in medicine, but in many areas. Historically, radiation was kind of a bad choice because they didn't have enough precision to consistently hit the target. So they had to reduce the dose uh, so they wouldn't damage surrounding structures, uh, but it would be an inadequate dose to truly consistently kill the cancers. So we had a problem back in those years of radiation not getting the job done, and then the surgeons would get handed a, a half treated situation uh, in which the surgery was more difficult as a result of the previous radiation. This idea that people should do surgery first uh, as a um, uh, way to have a backup plan uh, because radiation in, in the older style worked pretty well uh, for trying to mop up a few little specks of cancer. That uh, mindset, uh, since the decision-making process, uh, selecting between different treatment options, is always challenging to patients as they stumble into this crazy field. Um, that mindset has carried over from the days when radiation technology was uh, quite a bit inferior to what we have today. So it was a surgery-first mentality, use radiation as a backup. And you needed a backup for surgery because surgery can't cut a broad margin around the cancers, and so they would leave small specks of cancer behind after surgery, but that did respond well to some radiation coming in afterwards. The problem, of course, is who wants to get two treatments when you could just do one treatment? And now, over the last 10 years, radiation technology has advanced so much that uh, this concern about not sterilizing the cancer has really disappeared. The radiation therapist can get the job done the first time, and we don't need to worry about them leaving a mess that the surgeons have to pick up later because the cancer came back inside the prostate. I think a lot of people who are still looking up surgery versus radiation are kind of wondering, can you get radiation and then get surgery? Is there ever a point where that is suggested? Uh, the answer is yes. If you did need a backup after radiation, uh, surgery is feasible, although it is a little more difficult to do. There are doctors that do it. But I am um, not much of a, a fan of surgery in this modern era, pretty much under any circumstances, due to developments of other technologies in the interim. Surgery in its day, say back in 2005, uh, was as good or better than any other option. But now, in 2022, the, we have uh, all kinds of focal radiation treatments, focal high-intensity focused ultrasound, focal cryotherapy, focal electroporation. Why would we be removing this uh, rather difficult prostate when we can just treat where the tumor is? And the uh, need to do salvage surgery in my day-to-day -day experience as a medical oncologist um, is it's almost never at this point. Uh, the patients who uh, have surgery after treatment have more problems, but the patients that are, are just going into surgery for the first time, they have a lot of problems too with surgery. So uh, excess incontinence, excess impotence, um, and uh, you know, when I talk about incontinence, I mean it comes in many forms. So it's uh, stress incontinence, uh, you know, day-to-day -day just constant leakage type of incontinence, incontinence during sex. Um, it is just a problem that one wouldn't really want to embrace unless you had no other choice. Fifteen years ago, you could argue we had no other choice. 
In 2022, we have a lot of better choices. I've talked to many patients, and sometimes when they talk about surgery, they think that when it comes to incontinence or um, any sort of sexual side effects that they may have, that there's always something to fix that later. Is number one, you know, when it comes to, for instance, incontinence, is it simple to fix? Because I think a lot of people think, oh, I just take a pill or I get a procedure after that. To me, it sounds like it's much more complicated and it's a lifelong issue. It is uh, a lifelong issue. Uh, there are surgical methods to correct uh, severe urinary incontinence where they put an artificial sphincter, that's a small cuff around the, uh, the urethra, and they, they put a device in your tummy that uh, pumps water in and out of this, and they have a little switch that they put in your, in your scrotum, you pop a switch and you're able to urinate. Those work reasonably well, probably about 80% satisfaction in men that go through that type of uh, operation uh, when it's done at a center of excellence. But it's, it's a pretty big deal, and not everyone is fortunate to get uh, you know, the type of results they're hoping for. These devices can malfunction, and then you're back for another operation. So trying to do correction, corrective surgery for a surgery that didn't go well in the first place is um, a risky proposition, and, it, and it's not always going to turn out the way you want it to. And just to be clear, what percentage of men who have surgery are going to get side effects? Oh, at least half. Um, the side effects, uh, one doctor, uh, Dr. Scardino, came up with what he called the trifecta many years ago. He looked at, at uh, large groups of patients that uh, underwent surgery. These are ideal patients, small amounts of cancer in the hands of a fabulous surgeon. And the trifecta, of course, is no urinary leakage, restoration of adequate erections for intercourse, and, uh, and to remain in remission indefinitely or be cured. That's the trifecta. And the trifecta was happening in his carefully selected patients. Many of these were Gleason 6 patients, uh, Gleason 7 patients, people that should have very high cure rates. Um, trifecta has occurred in about half the patients where all three of those criteria were accomplished by a world-class surgeon. So the satisfaction rates with surgery in general, even in the hands of superstar surgeons, is not that great. So what about in radiation? What are the percentages there? Well, again, we have to compare apples and apples. So we're talking about a Scardino-level surgeon. You want to get that type of uh, radiation doctor, and there's many types of radiation, proton, SBRT, brachytherapy, so-called seed implants. All these things require skill, and, and there's a team behind these people having the right equipment. But if you get to centers that are doing a large volume and they've invested in the right infrastructure and, uh, and a good team of people, the uh, problems that we're seeing with modern radiation are much, much less than what we would see with surgery. The uh, incidence of serious erectile dysfunction is definitely less common than, it, than, it, uh, than with surgery. Uh, the incidence of incontinence is practically zero. The uh, uh, issues and frights of uh, rectal burns, because the prostate's right next to the rectum, uh, there always was a small but real incidence of proctitis, uh, a non-healing burn on the rectum, which was a dreadful problem. Uh, that has really been circumvented now with a, a gel that's injected between the rectum and the prostate called space or that pushes that out of the field. So these days we advise men that are uh, proceeding with some form of state-of-the-art radiation that they're going to have to face a risk of serious erectile dysfunction in a certain percentage of cases, that it won't be as high a risk as if you have surgery, but it still certainly can happen. So I know we said 50% in surgery. What percentage would you give for patients who have radiation? Well, if this is all age-related, and in surgery you talked about it, at least 50% of people had one thing that they are very unhappy about. One was um, impotence, incontinence, and the cancer coming back. Take a 60-year-old man who's not using any Cialis or Viagra. The incidence of... Um, Erectile dysfunction so serious that Cialis and Viagra don't work, uh, which is the way we describe impotence in the in the prostate cancer world. Uh, you're, you're looking at about a one in three, 25, 30 percent chance for a 60 uh, year old man to, to become so seriously impotent after radiation, within a couple of years after radiation, that uh, that they you know Cialis and Viagra won't work. Um, the incidence would be at least that high with surgery. Um, one thing that isn't talked about is that uh, there is a certain quality to erections 
in terms of their firmness and their durability and this sort of thing. And this is where I think surf, uh, surgically treated patients suffer in comparison to the radiation treated patients. The radiation treated patients seem to respond better to Cialis and Viagra, and more frequently their uh, erectile function is restored to what uh, couples say is like it was before. Even with Cialis and Viagra after surgery, only 5% of people say it's like it was before the treatment. So, uh, so there's not only the instance of capacity to get erections, but what kind of erections are these? And the men that are undergoing radiation are more satisfied and happy with the, with the results than the people who are getting surgery. This has all been reported in studies, but every year we send over 100 people for radiation treatments. I have patients who come to see me who've had surgery. I'm not recommending surgery anymore, but uh, I talk across the table on a regular basis with the people, with these people in, in very stark terms in terms of how are things working, how are you feeling, how's it going. So I'm basing this on firsthand experience in hundreds of patients that I treat on a daily basis. Uh, I don't have any connections with any radiation facilities other than the fact I try and select high quality uh, places to do treatment because we have less side effects. But there's an inescapable risk of erectile dysfunction with modern radiation and the risk is higher and the impotence is more severe in men that have surgery. When we see submissions coming in to the helpline and we get patients who are saying, my doctor is suggesting I get surgery, I'm trying to research radiation, maybe they're going and talking to a radiation oncologist, a lot of times the urologist is telling them, well, it's a Gleason 10 versus like a Gleason 6 or 7. Because it's a Gleason 10 and because of your Gleason grade, you absolutely need to get surgery and we need to get it out now. What would you say to that patient? The studies show that long-term cure rates with high Gleason scores, this is out of Johns Hopkins, um, are actually quite bad with surgery, much better with radiation. For example, people with Gleason scores of 9 and 10 that were treated at Johns Hopkins, 80% of those men relapsed over the next 15 years. Johns Hopkins is a center of excellence for surgery, so we can't blame it on bad surgery. It's just that surgery itself is not a good treatment for high-risk prostate cancer because these men will have small amounts of cancer coming out the edge of the prostate and uh, the surgeons can't cut a wider margin like they would with colon cancer or lung cancer because the bladder and the rectum are right next door. So they are forced to leave some of the cancer behind and most of these men end up getting radiation right after surgery as a precaution because if they don't, it's almost inevitable that the cancer will come back. High-grade cancers, uh, the argument should be much more, those are the people that need the radiation more. If anyone's going to do surgery, it should be the intermediate risk prostate cancer patients where at least the surgeon can be fairly confident they'll get the cancer out. If you're going to go into a treatment, one should go into the treatment with the mindset that this, it's a one and done, that, that this is going to cure it. Not that I'm going to fall back on some other thing if the treatment doesn't work. Um, that's just going to incorporate more side effects, more risks by doing two treatments. Radiation therapists, uh, on the other hand, have the capacity to, to uh, radiate a larger margin around the gland and make sure that they cover all the cancer. Uh, this is because you can radiate the edge of the bladder, you can radiate uh, up toward the rectum now because of space or, and make sure that you get a good margin. So can you re-radiate the prostate? It is done frequently. Typically in men uh, that had older types of radiation and now they have a problem coming back some years later, uh, modern radiation is so focused now that they can re-radiate where the tumor is in the prostate quite safely. I think one of the deciding factors when it comes to surgery and radiation that we're hearing from patients is that with, side, with surgery, you would know what the side effects are right away. Where with radiation, side effects could occur two years later, and sometimes that mindset um, causes some anxiety. It's like, well, what's going to happen to me in two years? At least I know what I would get right away. So how do you um, discuss this with your patients and give them some clarity on that? Patients are talking to surgeons, and the surgeons talk about their competitors, the radiation therapists, in somewhat derogatory terms, and they point out that truthfully that there is a possibility that the radiation which weakens the tissue, the surrounding tissue where the radiation hits, can result in delayed problems two, three, five, ten years after the treatment. I see this regularly in our radiation treated patients. Uh, it's much more common for men that have had previous radiation to say I, I noticed a little blood in my urine that the uh, the previous radiation to the urethra can cause some weakening of those tissues and, and uh, some blood in the urine is not at all uncommon after um, radiation. Uh, the, th the dreaded issues with uh, 
progression to scar tissue, so, uh, so-called strictures, uh, which can happen after surgery in three or four percent of men, is rare with the type of radiation that we're recommending. With seed implant radiation, they're able to pull the seeds uh, uh, somewhat away from the urethra so that uh, the dose to the urethra is attenuated. And uh, so we're not seeing any uh, strictures in professionally treated uh, patients who undergo seed implants. But we do counsel patients that uh, if you've had previous radiation, you don't want to have uh, people sticking cystoscopy uh, scopes up up the penis just to look around because those tissues are going to be somewhat more friable and weak uh, as a result of the radiation and that will be the case for the rest of their lives. The other issue that comes up, will will this radiation cause secondary tumors? And we're simply not seeing that. The studies that have been done uh, show a very low incidence of secondary bladder tumors or rectal tumors. I think it's because older radiation, they sprayed more around the, the prostate as well as the prostate, whereas modern radiation is confining the radiation right in the prostate. So we haven't seen uh, secondary tumors in men that have had seed implant radiation because all the radiation just stays in the prostate. So there's a lot of arguments uh, in favor of uh, radiation therapy, particularly seed implant radiation compared to doing, uh, doing an operation. So what percentage of men are getting strictures from radiation? Well, I think it depends on the quality of the radiation. We're seeing zero incidence of strictures in the radiated patients that we've been following. We started referring patients for seed implants up to uh, Swedish Institute in uh, Seattle 20, 25 years ago. And we've had hundreds of patients go through that type of uh, treatment. We haven't seen any strictures. If forms of radiation like brachytherapy work so well, why are patients talked to you about surgery so quickly? Why is this the number one thing that patients are hearing about? I think radiation now is starting to become more popular and patients are hearing about it, whether that's through the internet or the urologist talking about it a little more often. But brachytherapy is not really in the conversation at the get-go oftentimes. Prostate cancer is big business. Um, the doctors that um, are seeing these patients are trained as surgeons, uh, so it's a it's a very powerful guild and it's a uh, it's a special club. Surgeons uh, have like uh, F-16 de- jet pilots that land planes on aircraft carriers. They're they're an elite crowd and uh, they have a lot of confidence in their abilities. Prostate surgery has been around for more than 50 years and uh, it's quite an accomplishment to be able to remove a prostate from a human and walk away and the guy's still breathing and functioning. But uh, the objectivity that these surgeons have about what they do in the context of all the other options, especially since the other options have gotten so much better in the last 10 years, uh, that objectivity just isn't there. Uh, They still see the world the way it's always been. They're intelligent people. They're smart uh, enough to use a, a... a softer approach towards the people that are coming to them for advice, and they take the position of being an, uh, you know, a, a, a objective arbiter that let's talk about surgery, let's talk about radiation. But the conversations in subtle ways are always slanted towards surgery, and people are frightened. They aren't really comfortable taking time to figure out what to do, and so they're very grateful that they have a, a competent, impressive expert in front of them with a white coat who seems to know where he's going and what to do and usually has an opening in his surgical schedule in the next week so that they can get this done quickly and uh, and solve the the fears that are associated with being a, a undergoing a cancer diagnosis Thank you so much for watching this video on surgery versus radiation side effects. The goal of this video is to help bring clarity to the topics that your doctor is going to talk to you about when deciding upon this treatment. And your quality of life matters. We want to make sure that that is at the top of your mind when you're deciding about treatment. It's not just about getting the cancer out, it's about what your life will be like after that treatment. And the factors that we talked about in this video matter. So go ahead and write them down, talk to your doctor about them. Also, research your doctor. There are papers, have they written papers on the topic of their what type of treatment they're doing? What do the patient reviews say? How many procedures have they done? Are they new? Have, are they very experienced? Um, all of those are really important factors in regards to researching who's going to be your physician treating you. Because again, 
That will also help determine how the quality of life will be after treatment. If you would like more information, you can visit our website, PCRI.org. This could help you develop questions, research these things further, and it'll give you comparisons of more comparisons actually of surgery and radiation. If you have topics or any questions you would like us to cover in future videos, please leave them in the comment section below. We love you. Thank you for trusting us. I hope you have a great week. Thank you.